Sometimes I wonder how much shorter our attention spans can go. Commercials, right? There's so many colors, they're so fast, it's gotta like hook you in instantly. Uh, if it's a pre-roll on a video that you're watching, it's like the first three to five seconds is what matters, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like right before you skip ahead or you know move on to the next mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. So everything is trying to wedge into that first like three to five seconds of our lives. And if it doesn't hook us in that much time, then I guess whatever it is failed to some degree. Welcome to the Mindfulness Experience Podcast. This is Keith Fiveson. On this show, I had the pleasure of speaking with Daniel Seberg, who is the author of The Digital Diet and co-author of Digital Legacy, Take Control of Your Online Afterlife. Daniel gave me perspectives on the past, present, and future of technology and what it means to have a digital mindset, not only in terms of usage, but also how to create a legacy for your loved ones. Daniel has a rich background, having spent several years as a senior executive at Google and Hawaii, and 12 years in news across ABC News, CBS News, and CNN as an Emmy-nominated science and technology correspondent. I really enjoyed this conversation, and I hope you do too. Good morning, Daniel. Good morning, Keith. It's great How to be are with you. you. Oh, I'm doing well. I'm on my third cup of coffee. So. You're, uh, and I, I, I apparently need a couple of more cups of coffee. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I feel like that. I feel like that a lot, actually, maybe yeah. too much. Yeah. 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 So, um, you know, Daniel, I'm so happy to be here with you. You you, and I know each other for over 10 years. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I remember we first met when we were going down to Mexico. I had uh, just started to look at your book. You had a book that you were publishing back then. And uh, it was a very interesting book. Can you I, I, what I want to do is I, I want to give our listeners a little bit of insight into who you are uh, as and now you're the co-founder, chief content officer with Good Trust and you're the direction of innovation marketing at Moody's. Is that is that right? That's right. Yeah. And I, I guess at a high level, I would say I've been at this crazy intersection of technology and humanity and storytelling, something like that. This, uh, you know, the ways mm. that all of all of those intersect and for the past, uh, you know, gosh, 30 plus years in a, in a professional sense, maybe, although my, my father's an engineer. And um, so I think I've been exposed to technology and trying to understand how anything works for, you know, the better part of my life, if you will. So, yeah, and just how it relates to all of us and um, trying to tell those stories. Right. Now, you're originally from Canada. You came down uh, at an early age and you got involved in the uh, communications field, right? You got involved uh, with some of the big, uh, some of the big networks. I did. I left, uh, I left my dream job actually, Keith, mm -hmm. because I was a daily reporter at the Vancouver Sun, mm -hmm. um, at a, a newspaper in Vancouver. And then I was recruited by CNN and so spent uh, initially time at CNN.com and then ended up on television quite by accident and I became a, a CNN science and technology correspondent, and then worked at CBS uh, with Katie Couric uh, for a number of years, um, left news altogether. And then around the time that we met, uh, which was when I was working on the digital diet uh, book and uh, spent a year at ABC News and then went uh, in the, totally in the other direction, if you will. So I went from kind of like the storytelling and the news side over to the technology side and worked at Google for, for several years. And mm. then left Google about uh, four and a half years ago to leap into entrepreneurship. And that's been a, a roller coaster, Keith, that we can jump into in any way you want, but there's been some, a need to pay some bills. So I've taken some jobs here and there, which have been rewarding in their own way. But now uh, you've, you, you really were a, a pioneer of sorts. I mean, you were involved in the technology sector and reporting on it back all the way back in the nineties when, you know, we had the 2400 baud modem. And then, you know, 10 years ago, I mean, you wrote this book about the digital diet and you really saw something happening in the several overall uh, zeitgeist of, of, of society that really you try to warn people about. And I'm, I'm just wondering, like, 
like, you know, can you can you bring us back there with a little bit of hindsight in terms of where you were and where where you were back 10 years ago and where you might see it today? Yeah, if you think sort of like, you know, circa 2010, if you will, and we were all um, starting to consume social media on our mobile devices. So these, you know, two sort of bigger trends were happening in parallel. Um, and it started to become something, the, the, the connectivity part of our lives started to shift into something that wasn't a, wasn't so binary as kind of on and off, or I'm at my computer or I'm not at my computer. Um, all, it, it just became a kind of an always on experience for us. Mm. And we started to put our phones on our nightstands when we went to bed. Uh, we started to wake up and think about, you know, what we missed the night before. Mm -hmm. We started to get notifications from people we sort of knew and people we can remember from a past life, uh, you know, on different social networks. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden we were just consumed by this whole other universe of communication. Mm -hmm. Sort of the and beginning it, of ADD, attention deficit disorder. And, yeah. Right. That, that I think we were all experiencing mm -hmm. on some level. And I think... I was, I guess I was imagining I was a bit of the canary in the coal mine because it was mm -hmm. happening to me partly by virtue of my job. So I was mm -hmm. asked to consume a lot of this and um, started to see what it was doing to me, to my relationships, to mm -hmm. how I was, um, you know, uh, not able to disconnect in ways that, that felt sort of appropriate to the moment, mm -hmm. um, the psychological effects that were having on me. So, yeah, it became, it was initially a, I wrote a blog for cbsnews.com and just started to sort of suggest that maybe we shouldn't be racing headlong mm -hmm. into the future without mm -hmm. thinking about some of these things um, and was trying to be that sort of the person who was like waving from the frontier like hold on hold on like this I know this seems like a great right. direction and all that but let's just talk about this for a second right right so and this whole yeah. uh, this whole idea of being the canary in the coal mine i mean uh you know we're talking about mindfulness experiences and uh you know one of the things that we talked about earlier was the whole idea of uh surveillance capitalism lost agency uh you know social uh mindfulness how do we uh you know our attention is on sale you know i i think there was a report uh how true it was i don't know but that, you know, people have uh, the attention span of a goldfish or even less than the attention span, eight seconds. And I think it's probably even less now with this TikTok culture. What are your thoughts about all that? Sometimes I wonder how much shorter our attention spans can go mm -hmm. because, you know, it does seem as though we grow weary of whatever it is that's, you know, in front of us really quickly. And you can see it in so many different ways. Commercials, right? Used to be that, and, and of course, so many of us consume content through streaming services where you don't need to sit through commercials. But if you are watching a commercial of any kind on your computer, whatever it is, there's so many colors, they're so fast, it's gotta like hook you in instantly. Uh, if it's a pre-roll on a video that you're watching, it's like the first three to five seconds is what matters, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like right before you skip ahead or you know move on to the next mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. So everything is trying to wedge mm -hmm. into that first like three to five seconds of our lives. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't hook us in that much time, then I guess whatever it is failed to some degree. But to me, that's putting so much pressure on content creators mm -hmm. to just, you know, it used to be that when you wrote an article, it was like the lead, right? The first sentence or the first paragraph or something that was like enough to bring people into the rest of the story. Mm -hmm. And now it's it's that on, you know, a whole other level. Um, and it, it does mm. start to, you know, you, you start to think, OK, am I missing out on something? Um, and, and you have a I think it, it <clears throat> hampers our ability to focus on on just about anything like a conversation. Right. Right. Just this listening to somebody starts to feel difficult. I can see it even with, you know, with children, my own children. Right. Being able to, like, keep their attention with something. So I'm always encouraging to do things like I make eye contact really get them to focus the, the, the deeper parts of their right. brain and their thinking on what's happening. Right. Be right. in the so, moment. Yeah. So this, this whole idea of being in the moment is, is, is very, very challenging when we're continually, you know, presented with uh, tr uh, things that attract us, sex, 
uh, you know, a new car, some sort of satisfying new delight, something that tempts us or on the other side, aversion, right? Things that make us fearful, you know, trauma, uh, the, the war, the, uh, the fact that there is disaster, you know, we don't hear a lot of those things. So we're, we're really moved from one side to the other uh, in so many ways on one end, being told the world's going to end and you know you better go ahead and get yours now and on the other side being presented with so many choices uh that you know really attract us whether or not it's food or a new car or some other device or something along that line and that put, puts a pulls us away from our own inner uh knowledge our own inner wisdom our sense of being able to sit there and just be with life be a human being as i say exactly you, uh, and, I, and, I, go ahead yeah no, I just was going to say, I think it's, it's, I think maybe the difficulty is for people sometimes to see the rewards of that experience, right? Mm. What do they get out of that? If you're going to ask people to be still and to be, you know, either more mindful or just like take a break from everything, like just go sit over here and don't do anything for a little bit. Um, it's, it's hard sometimes just for for people to kind of say, well, okay, well, what am I going to get out of it though? You know, and it's, it's sometimes, it, I think in some ways it comes down to just to, to just doing it. It's a little hard to explain sort of the value of it to people. Hey, you're going to feel more grounded or you're going to feel more confident or you're going to feel more calm or, you know, whatever it is. And people are like, no, really? Okay, but I but I have to go do this thing right now. And there's this thing over here, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, can I just go? All right. And, and sometimes it's like really, you kind of have to force people to, to get out of their routine a little bit. And I'm not sure that I had a whole lot of, I mean, the book came out 10 years ago. I was a voice in the, <laughs> in the noise. There were other people talking about this. Um, I'm, of, of course, you know, you, I think I've said this to you before, Keith, but I'm definitely not the model of perfection with any of this. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a learning experience. Well, so, I mean, same us, here. Just, I mean, you know, yeah, we're, we're yeah. all challenged by this, aren't we? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So it's, it's a bit of, you know, you, you just keep trying to find the ways to improve day by day and, you know, two steps forward, one step back or something like that. But, um, but yeah, it, it, it became something that I was and, and continue to be passionate about. Um, mm -hmm. at the same time I was working in technology. So I, you know, I was working at Google when the book, uh, right. started to get, get traction and I would get, hear people say all the time, how can you work in a tech company and, and write about this subject? And I would say, well, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. And in fact, a lot of people in tech see this as super important yeah but one of the things that you brought to the table and i think it's so true is you know i i, I think uh, technology is sort of the default addiction of our society right i mean if you don't have technology you're really not you know you're not on it what do you mean you don't have an email what do you mean you don't have a text you know what do you mean you're not on instagram facebook whatever it is right and um, i think what you really tried to bring into tune was to be more mindful around technology to have a diet specifically you know diet might be a bad word but to really kind of take some time to really look at your your you know to have the recognition and to make the right choices mm -hmm. and you know we talk about recognition and choice on the show a lot you know this is the difference between stimulus and response stimulus and response and what you did in that book which was great is you really provided the framework for that and yet at the same point you know what you're saying now and i hear it loud and clear is that you were in the business of going ahead and actually enabling the technology and enabling the use but using it in a very constructive using it in a more constructive mindful way right you know has that is that the same thing today has it changed do you think that today uh you know google changing its uh you know be um you know be kind or be good to all people what was the phrase that they used uh you know uh you you know what the what was it uh uh do no harm thank you very much yeah. oh, the, oh don't be evil yeah the, don't be uh, evil the, don't be initial, evil do yes no google's harm. initial yeah. like mission yeah statement. Yes, yeah and yes, they've exactly. taken that yeah. away right uh, there's no longer a do no do a, a don't be evil you know it's or do no harm you know and and i'm wondering uh what your thoughts are today and how people might you know be more mindful today with their with their digital footprint yeah i think it's i mean you know i did i i, I do still sort of suggest to people to to you know imagine some parallels with food or, or anything that you consume right that that we make choices and and you know 
that uh, that there are consequences, if you will, depending on what those choices are. Um, you know, in, in a way, maybe it's the same as a as a chef writing a book about which foods are the best ones to mm. eat, or mm -hmm. you know, like not overeating or not mm -hmm. eating the wrong foods or something. Right? They're still creating, but our farmer or whoever is producing, right. you know, the experience for you. Um, they also yeah. want to ensure that you're doing it in a way that isn't detrimental it's, and especially if it's uh, vegan food or plant-based food i'm i'm very particular so there you go right so <laughs> right and um i mean i just recently became a bit more of a pescatarian mm -hmm. thinking about the effects of of meat and i haven't quite gone the the vegan route but mm -hmm. i do now find myself making different choices when it comes to eating food and it's not easy necessarily because the world is not set up for people right. who prefer to eat a little differently the same is true of technology it's really easy to just download a bunch of apps and use a bunch of stuff and sign up for all these things and like what does it all mean really um and if you're not more mindful in how you do any of that mm -hmm. or why the mm -hmm. central question of why then you just kind of fall into these traps and then you know your 20 minutes or your hour or your your day goes by and you think oh well, what did I do really, or what right, did I accomplish? Right. Yeah, so. what? Yeah, yeah. How did I? How did I spend my life? Did I? Did yeah. I actually think about anything, or do anything, or uh, was I of service to anyone? Yeah, right? yeah. And yeah. I think that's a big part of it, right? I mean, mm -hmm. a lot of the experience with technology starts to feel like it's feeding into your ego, or a bit of your your self, right? And and what's important to you versus mm -hmm. when you, I think, when you disconnect or when you're more mindful you're you are generally speaking thinking of others you're you know maybe more in service of other people you're not so focused on kind of your own personal gratification of mm -hmm. whatever that mm -hmm. is consuming something or sharing something about yourself so. right so so i mean you know what's what 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 were what do you think some of the answers are because you know you've you've been around the world you've been over 70 countries you've uh you know you followed the track here from you know 2200 baud modems to work you know talking about different companies doing different things with technology and you know how things are today you know i i think that uh, technology serves a purpose for people who are you know quite honestly dealing uh, with a lot of trauma to today you know we see trauma tv we see it everywhere as i've said and you know i mean they don't necessarily want to show up for reality you know so i'm i'm, I'm just wondering from your viewpoint because you're now doing a lot of work on helping people think of what their legacy is mm -hmm, you know mm -hmm. and 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 you know where do you think things are going i mean the situation today is i think we're only going to see more technology maybe even implants or glasses or whatever i have no idea but people will certainly uh try to uh, make sure that they don't miss out uh mm -hmm. and but from that viewpoint where do you i mean legacy is a, a you know digital legacy i think that's a very profound uh concept can you explain that a little bit and what that's all about i mean that's the kind of work you're doing now right yeah and i think it you know so i i mentioned this intersection of like technology humanity and and storytelling if you will mm -hmm. and to me the, the the legacy part it's like in some ways we've kind of aged through technology i mean and by we i mean like you me and you know people who are who can kind of remember back to the the dawn of the connectivity part of it if you will because mm -hmm. i feel like that was such a sea change in just you know how we connected as a as a as a species i mean mm -hmm. you know all of a sudden you could connect with people on the other mm -hmm. side of the world right changed right. so much of the last 25 let's call it close to 30 years and okay, accelerated years, over the right? last two years with zoom i mean we're we're, exactly. we're online with people around the world now i mean you know it's like everyday occurrence yeah right it doesn't seem like there are borders time zones all that right. stuff we're all just like yeah. we can see 24 each other 7. And, yeah. 24 7. so it, it, it did get me thinking about this idea of memories and mm -hmm. legacy and, and what you want to pass on um and anyway a couple of years ago i uh was connected to another former Googler, a guy named Ricard Stiber, who mm -hmm. had this idea for a company called Good Trust, which is all about helping people to preserve their digital assets and memories. Um, and so we wrote a book together um, called Digital Legacy. Um, Congratulations. About... I, I just saw that came out this uh, this year, this last Thank year. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Oh. And uh, it was um, 
it was a learning experience for both of us to kind of uh, come in and discover all the ways that people have been thinking about digital legacy, whether it's about a like a hologramic representation of somebody who's already passed away and you can have this like AI mm, chat mm -hmm, experience mm -hmm. with them or something more pragmatic like memorializing your Facebook page mm -hmm. or uh, recovering photos from a Google account uh, mm -hmm. of somebody who had died, right? They're just a lot of, there's sort of like the emotional side and the and the pragmatic mm -hmm. side of what you're yeah, yeah. There's is. a Now, wait a second. There, there, there was a movie with Robin Williams. I think it was called The Cutter. I don't know if yeah. you remember this movie, but it yeah. was sort of like they, they everyone had a Google cam on them or something like that. And their whole life was presented. And his role was to go ahead and put the pieces together in terms of a film and a narrative. It sounds very similar to that. In much, in many ways, yes. So, yeah. and in that yeah. in that movie, he had this kind of the moral weight of mm -hmm. what to include or not include about somebody's life, right? Because right. if if anybody could see inside all of our memories you know they're probably a little shocked to, to right. see everything that's really happened oh, and, the, and there's the yeah. stuff the right there's there's the stuff that you do want to pass on oh no <laughs> the stuff that you that you would prefer that people maybe didn't all have a look at right, right. um and this has just been human uh mm -hmm. nature since we started passing on stories and right. but now we're creating so much more in a digital sense right we mm -hmm. write however many emails every day, we take however many photos every day, posts, mm -hmm. social media mm -hmm. posts, accounts we've created. There is a story of us that's in the digital mm -hmm. realm, right. if you will. Ne never, never, mind, never mind our search history as well as oh, all of right. the, all no, of the exactly. incognito windows that we may yes. or may not go to. Yeah. No, no, this is, that's, the, that's like the, the uh, that's like the- That's the shadow. That's what we call the shadow. Yeah. Right, that, and that's, that, that's, that's that id part of our brain mm -hmm. that that is that we're actually you know the things like this is what we used to talk about at Google with Google Trends mm -hmm. that social social data is more the ego something you want to put out there and how you want to be seen right. whereas a Google search is is much more like mm -hmm. I really want to know this thing right. Right? Yeah. we're not going to tell people <laughs> yeah I, maybe I need to go to Duck and Go yeah yeah <laughs> or, right what, <laughs> Duck Duck whatever duck, go, what yeah is, is that what it's called Duck Go I think it is yeah I think it, yeah yeah something like that yeah so it's so. <laughs> So we now, so now we've been thinking a lot about, yeah. So Good Trust is is the the company that grew out of all of this, mm -hmm. and um, yeah. So we've raised some money, and we've got mm -hmm. more than a hundred thousand um, uh, customers, if you will. Most Amazing. of them are on a, a free model, but mm -hmm. we help people to now also not just to think about their digital legacy and take care of accounts mm -hmm. and maybe uh, bring stories to life in new ways. We offer this ability to animate photos and kind of create new memories out of older mm -hmm. photos and that kind of thing, mm -hmm. but also estate planning. So we allow people to create a will, for example, mm -hmm. or a durable financial power of attorney or a funeral directive. And anyway, we've, there are a lot of ways that we're thinking about kind of where this could go, mm -hmm. but it's a bit of like sort of protect and organize your digital assets mm -hmm. and memories is, is sort of the wow. tagline. And that. then so, I, I remember us talking about uh, doing something maybe with ancestry or really looking at the the whole timeline of a person's yeah. life. I mean, you know, this is a lot of people uh, don't do it because there's a lot of work to it. But it sounds like, um, you know, what you're doing at Good Trust really kind of makes it a little easier. And, I think that's it. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's like you got to try to make it as frictionless and enjoyable as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe even something that you're more invested in as your life sort mm -hmm. of goes forward rather than something you do later in life and try to remember all this stuff and find these mm -hmm. things right you kind of do it over time i mean if you if i asked you mm -hmm. keith where would anybody find the story of you right 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 well, yep yep well you know um, i i the only thing i could say right now is in my book the mindfulness experience eight yep. strategies to live life now and you've I'm Which I have read you, and love you it. You read yes. it and you gave us a great review, and I, I, yep, I so yep. much appreciate that. But yeah, I think that's the question. They'd probably find me on Facebook, and they'd have to go back over, you know, the last 10, 12 years to all of my posts to at least see what I put out there and mm -hmm. to see if I was vulnerable or not, or whether or not it was just some sort of how many wonderful meals I had. Yeah. Sure. Right. And so, <laughs> exactly. And sometimes we come across photos of somebody and the and the context isn't there or mm -hmm. whatever it is right so that's one of the things we're thinking about is this kind of timeline feature where you're a bit of you and you can bring in people to collaborate with you so it starts to feel mm -hmm. like something you share 
privately, so with mm -hmm. people maybe in your family or your close friends, the story of you, but not something you broadcast um, mm -hmm. out to the rest of the world because it's not about that. Um, mm -hmm. So is a lot of this done uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis? Do you use artificial intelligence to go ahead and help put the story together? I mean, I'm wondering from a mindfulness viewpoint, you know, what yeah. what kind of uh, what kind of uh, involvement I would yeah. have, and and how do you go about doing that? You put together a questionnaire and, and sorts like that. Yeah, those so the, all of those are, are options on the table mm -hmm. as we kind of go forward on uh, mm -hmm. with that part of it to, to develop it. Um, well, you know, there are companies that are doing some of this already. They've created, you know, these chatbot experiences uh, mm -hmm. with somebody who's already passed away. So, you you know, and, and anybody who has someone who has, you know, if you, I don't have a lot of people in my life. I can't say, you know, like I know so many people who have died, but I have, you know, I don't know. I'd call it a dozen people who I had a relationship with and right. they've passed on. Right. And I think who, however many you have in your life, there's we all kind of imagine some way we're still communicating with them right or we talk to them in their right. absence right yeah um and and this in some ways is maybe the digital evolution of of some right way. well i think that's beautiful and we've seen it kind of represented in uh you know movies stories you know where we're kind of ongoing having these relationships or conversations i think they uh did it uh, uh at the jewish museum uh was yes it? that's that, right you know? that's right there's a whole yep. uh, hologram experience where you can go ahead and have conversations. Um, yes. What what you you seem to know a lot more about it than I do. What what what, no, what was your experience with that? That is a company called Storyfile, mm -hmm. and so they interviewed uh, a number of Holocaust survivors about mm. their experience, and they come up with I think it was something like three or four hundred questions, maybe more, mm. and then those they run that through some machine learning. Uh, so that you can come up with a natural, like a conversational AI experience, and they recorded them on video. And so in the Illinois Holocaust Museum, these Holocaust survivors were sort of seated in a chair in front of an audience, and then you could ask them questions. What was it like, mm -hmm. you know, being uh, held in, in any of these uh, camps, for example, or how, how did you... Uh, survive, um, you know, after the war or something like that, and then that would trigger them to respond mm. to you. And they they now offer this to anybody, so you can create this experience with your own life. Uh, they have an app where you can record uh, answers to questions. You can share that with Fantastic. people. Wow. So they've taken it in a whole bunch of directions. Actually, did, they did one with well, they did one with Santa, uh, so you can uh -huh. ask Santa a bunch <laughs> of questions for the kids. And then William uh -huh. Shatner has been one of their big. Um, uh -huh pioneers and right. you know we all know he went into space recently and right, so on but right, right so yeah so this whole idea i mean ray kurzweil's uh, uh concept of downloading our our intelligence downloading our whole bios if you will into the cloud yeah. it sort of seems like it's taking shape in a number of ways not only in terms of what's out there today but the ability to then use ai which asks you a number of questions which creates a, a whole psychographic profile if you will Exactly. And I feel like, you know, we get this a lot that people have because we can do this. We animate people's photos. So, for example, you could have a photo of your, you know, your grandfather, which, mm -hmm. you know, is pr presumably black and white and a bit mm -hmm. grainy. But mm -hmm. you could upload it through the Good Trust platform and it animates it in a way that looks like video. Oh, wow. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you can it starts to add this kind of layer of personality and people's reaction to it is quite visceral, whether it's that or any of these examples we're talking about. I feel like it falls into one of two camps right now. It's either cool or it's mm -hmm. creepy mm -hmm. and and people just it's like one or the other people have a strong reaction to this right. they, they, they they don't there's no i don't the very few it's cases where people cool are like or eh. creepy. Yeah. yeah they're cool or creepy right um i don't know what the percentages are exactly right. but i think uh, but i think a lot of it comes down to whether it's somebody in your life or or or, or a total stranger or mm -hmm. somebody else so for example if it was my uh you know grandfather mm -hmm. and i was able to communicate with him and because i never knew my neither of my mm -hmm. grandfathers one of them died before i was born and one when i was two mm -hmm. so if i could have some relax relationship with them and hear their right. voice or their wisdom right. in some ways that would be right. super cool to me but maybe right. creepy to somebody else yeah and i uh what well, what's 
Exactly. And I, but what, what I, what I love about that is, you know, the emotional intelligence around it and the interaction and the ability to actually learn because, you know, sometimes the history, like just reading the history and not having the physicality of it, or at least the simula simu simulation of the physicality of it, uh, doesn't necessarily, um, translate or, or really on a very visceral level, get into our bones or get into our understanding or our wisdom, if you will. Yeah. You know? Right. Exactly. And I do yeah. think that, you know, there's something about in a, in a, you know, in a, in a mindful way, if you will, mm -hmm. the value of stories and human mm -hmm. experiences. And when we pass those on to people, that's like that shared wisdom mm -hmm. that ideally is, is asking the next generation to, I sort of think about it with my daughters. I'm like, I hope they, sort of become wise as soon as possible, if you will, mm. like to sort of understand what that means and to really, you know, be, I think the expression sometimes is like, you're older than your years, or you seem like you've been, right? People have all these expressions for how it seems when young people seem to possess wisdom at a younger age. Mm -hmm. And and I, for their sort of future, I, I mm -hmm. to me, that's really important that they get that as soon as possible. So. I hope I can pass that on, expose it to them through other family members, these kind of stories, right? Mm -hmm. And then the sooner that you kind of adopt that approach to life, I feel like the better because you can still enjoy life, have fun, do whatever you want, great. But if you mm. kind of have that just foundational wisdom and, and philosophical outlook on life, I think it can help you to be grounded, get through trauma, get through things that feel like they're headwinds in your life. As long as you have that as a as sort of like a your spine or your base, if you will, um, the better off you are. I wish I had, you know, I think my parents did their best to try to mm -hmm. get it into me. And then I mm -hmm. left Canada and went off and, you know, sought my fame and fortune. And <laughs> so it's been mixed results thus far. But um, so, well, yeah. I, 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 I think you're an incredible, incredible success. And uh, I'm really so uh, proud and happy to uh, have you on the show. I, I, I'm wondering for your perspective, talking about mindfulness, you know, we talk about the wings of mindfulness, one being wisdom, the other one being compassion. And, you know, in order to be mindful, we have to have the ethics, as you say, the sense of where have we been, where are we now, and where do we want to go to? And, you know, we talk about breathing life into that in terms of aspiration and mm -hmm. using compassion as a way to really take off and set, because when we're really caught in judgment mode, you know, whether or not it's self judgment or judgment of others, we're not really open to the ability to expand or move forward. I'm wondering from your viewpoint, you know, we, we took a look at where we were uh, at the beginning back in the 90s, we talked about, you know, your, your ability to actually foresee a lot of the issues that went into, you know, the use of technology and through the digital diet. Now we're looking at the digital legacy and, you know, the whole idea of creating a legacy that really is meaningful, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm wondering from your viewpoint, where do you see things going? And, you know, for the listeners, for people who might be listening here, what are the like pieces of wisdom that you might drop, you know, even if your daughters were listening in, you know, uh, 10 years from now, they found this podcast and they said, huh, I wonder what, I wonder what dad had to say. You know, mm -hmm. uh, so I'm just putting you on the spot there. So what do you what do you think about that? Wow. Oh, boy. Keith. I mean, I feel like, you know, I, um, you know, I, you know, I've, these days I feel like in some ways my life is is really complicated um, because of just logistical reasons and jobs and money and relationship and scheduling and a lot of stuff that kind of pulls me in different directions. And I think that my goal, if you will, is get closer to some simplicity in life. And I think when we adopt too many new things, too many new technologies, too many new this, that, and the other thing, we lose the value of that simplicity. And I think there's a, you know, of course there are entire philosophies and religions built on this and you know I'm, I'm not the buddhist expert but some amount of just that like what you need rather than what you want and i think you know um I, i've tried to learn that in a big way and i i also if my daughters are listening but what i like to say to them is that there's sort of you know, there's what we need there's what we would like and there's what we want and i think 
you know, for a long time I was living my life in this kind of somewhere between what I would like and what I would want mm -hmm. rather than focusing on what I need and kind of allowing the other stuff to just happen as a result of whatever actions I was taking. Um, and so there's a, so yeah, I'm, I mean, in in the tech in the tech sort of like trends sphere mm -hmm. of like where are we all headed. Mm -hmm. Oh boy, I mean, I, I you know, it's so funny because last night uh, my daughters and, and my partner and I we watched that movie I Robot, mm -hmm. um, you mm -hmm. know, which of course is based on Isaac Asimov's book. Yeah, right. And um, the idea that we're now sort of living with. Um, almost like a, almost like a sentient um, mm -hmm. entity with our smart home devices, our phones, self-driving cars, it, the list goes on and on, right? And I mm -hmm. think we're getting closer and closer to that sort of existence and, you know, Ray Kurzweil singularity, like just mm -hmm. this merger of humans and mm -hmm. technology or machines, if you will, is just going to keep accelerating, I feel like. Um, and yeah. So I'm I'm sort of like oh. equally excited and afraid, which I guess maybe we all are. Yeah, yeah. Well, you you know you brought you bring up a lot of good points. Uh, you know about you know just being you know the past is regret, the future is anxiety, and the real value is really being in the moment as a human being. You know, and really mm -hmm. connecting in with the uh, things that are always here, like the earth, the sky, the water, the plants, the beautiful sunrise sunset and the ability to really commune and be in community with other people you know and 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 obviously you know you enjoy some food along the way and some good rest and you know some peace of mind and the ability to have good relationships and all the other things that really make up you know a life you know at the end yeah. of the day they don't say to you how hard did you work they say how ma how much love or how many people have you touched so that's you know, right. I, I think that's uh, I think that's wise uh, wise stuff that you're talking about. Well, you know, I, I learned a lot from my uh, my sister, who's a nurse practitioner, and she um, spent some time in palliative care, mm -hmm. and she said that you know, um, and there's been some studies about this, but you know, people don't lie close to death and say, "I wish I had posted more on social media. I wish I had written more emails. I wish I had spent more time in the office." right they say i wish i had spent more time with my family or you know devoted myself to more service or whatever it is right these are just like i think human experience so we sometimes i, I guess whatever reason we like push those away and right. like deny that that's really why we're all here in pursuit of the shiny objects right. um but if you can't appreciate those little things like you were talking about the flowers the water the sun the trees the, right mm -hmm. if you can't appreciate those then no amount of the bigger things will ever help you they right. just won't no amount of money no amount of you know cars house this mm -hmm. that it you know and my mom my mom was the one who would just say over and over again you know stop mm -hmm. and smell the flowers danny mm -hmm. right like this mm -hmm. was like her mantra yeah. like stop <laughs> and smell the flowers. And, and as a kid you know you're just like oh mm -hmm. all right mom. those flowers you know? again <laughs> Yes, right. It's you don't true. know anything about shiny new objects, Mom. Let me show. Yeah, you. right. Come on, Mom. It's like not cool. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is this has been a delight. Uh, uh, you know, I I feel like we could talk for another half hour or so, but uh, I know uh, you know there are little tidbits and little conversations. How do people find out about you and the work that you're doing, Daniel? Sure. Well, okay. Thank you. So I would say so. Mygoodtrust.com is the mm -hmm. is the site uh, for good trust. And um, yeah, if people want to know more about me, I mean, I'm, I am, you know, digitally available, if you will, and, mm -hmm. and certainly, you know, LinkedIn or, or wherever people come across uh, me. I'm, you know, there's a lot of stuff about me online, not, not all of which sure. I'm super proud of necessarily, but that's just life. So. Well, I've, I haven't found any of that stuff. Uh, and I, I, yeah. I did a, a, a little bit of Googling, but not as, I'm sure I'm not as good as you. Uh, well, the. <laughs> The name is Daniel Seberg, S-I-E-B-E-R-G, and you can find him at goodtrust.com or uh, Google him. And uh, I'm really so thrilled to have you on the show, uh, Daniel. Uh, thank you so much for showing it's, up. It's my pleasure, Keith. And I'm going to say this. I know it's at the end and, and mm -hmm. you know, you're not paying me to say this for all the people who are listening, but you've always been a mentor for me. 
and I really just value the relationship that we have. And over the past 10, I think it's more like 11 or 12 years at this point, mm -hmm. but you know, I can remember just your wisdom and serenity and how you were approaching life. And I just remember thinking, I'd like to be like that someday. Oh, so it's very kind. anyway, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And yeah. I didn't pay you to say that, but thank you so much. <laughs> it's true. You really can leave it in or you can take it out. But <laughs> No, that's absolutely wonderful. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you for being a part of the Mindfulness Experience podcast. I hope you enjoyed this mind-blowing conversation with Daniel Seberg. I also hope that you gained some valuable insights for yourself and your family to create a more mindful digital diet and legacy. Please follow the podcast to connect with future episodes as well. Subscribe, leave us a review, and suggest topics that you'd like to hear. Connect with us on social media, visit our website, for more mindfulness experiences. Thank you again, and I hope to see you on the next show. Take care.